All right, guys, from here on out, discography discussion is going to be more like discography discussion in 2016. Jeff. Hey, y'all. Fine. Would a million dollars change it? You accept? Copious amounts of alcohol is required. Scratch that. Reverse it. Let's, let's start for real this time. You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 281, The Red Cord. Hosted by Dan Terry. James Brown, Six Screams. And Joseph Wren. Ladies and gentlemen, unpleasable metal fan. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you tread on the necks of kings while dreaming in dog years, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. Well, 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 it is time to pull the red cord. I know they told you not to, but you have to pull it. You must pull it. It is your destiny to pull it. Is this like the plug where you have to pull the plug and that ends whatever's going on? Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, the red cord is actually not a cord that you pull. I, I hope you guys know that. Sincerely, we were making a joke. Got to explain everything these days. No, I'm kidding. Again, the Red Cord is an American metal band. They are amazing. I'm going to tell you more about them later after we get through our normal show introduction. Sit down. See how you guys are doing. See how we're doing. Thank you for joining us today. Did you enjoy the Red Cord this week, Dan? I know I did. I have been enjoying the Red Cord since about, I don't know, about 2003. So, yeah, um, I, I would say that... Uh, these guys are definitely one of my favorite bands, something of a hidden gem, so to speak. I never talk about them because it wasn't until we got to this episode that I was like, man, I haven't listened to the Red Chord in forever. I was like, I wonder if they're as good as I remember, because some of the bands that we talk about on this show, like I remember them being a certain way, and then we go and check them out again, and I'm like, oh, oh okay, that was back when I just kind of liked everything that sounded like this and didn't necessarily like half much of a discerning a discerning ear i know i've heard this band because well whenever dan drives the car he has to have control of the stereo but it has been a while and i felt right at home with the blasting drums mixed with heavy metal guitars the classic heavy vocals just sound like normal to me now i appreciate the enunciation but that's not why we're here. We are here to slaughter everyone in the pit. And I think the Red Chord holds up their end of the bargain. We only had a few albums from this band, but we had the 10-year career that most metalcore bands are known for having at that time. Yeah, and these guys were a little bit different, too, in the sense that they were, you know, absolutely... They definitely had that hardcore influence, but I almost feel like I almost feel like they came to it in a more sincere way, if that makes sense. They're like, guys, what do you guys want to want to play today? Well, man, I'm really, really into grindcore. Cool. Yeah, we'll play some grindcore. Yeah, cool. Well, I mean, I'm more into like hardcore bands. Yeah, that's cool. You know, and then and then you've got a guitarist that's like, yeah, but I mean, we can, we can like keep it complex, right? Like lots of changing and up and stuff because like I don't want to get bored, you know, just playing grind. And, uh, and that, that's kind of how you get the red cord sound is you've got a very unhinged hardcore band that flows into grindcore almost seamlessly, but has enough complexity that if the band was still around would probably be making like prog music at this point or not. It's impossible to tell. They, they might just, they, they may have just gotten this style of music down to a point where it was comfortable for them. But what I like about this band is that they're not comfortable. They bring it hard. They bring it fast. It's in your face. They don't waste your time. The albums aren't overly long. And they're not overly complex at first. Like, you might miss it. If you if you listen to this band and you're not paying attention, very similar to Atheist, the band we just talked about, if you're not paying attention, you may not notice the nuance in what's being played. You may just hear like a straight ahead grind and they're really great at that but they're also really good at throwing in more complexity 
to make riffs that will actually stick in your head. Like, I wouldn't necessarily say that these are memorable songs as much as they are memorable parts, stuff that you were, stuff that sticks with you. And that's actually somewhat unusual with like the slightly more technical leaning bands. Well, before Dan and I decide how heavy it is, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Podchaser. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews and the Discord server. Take it away, Dan. Well, I'm going to do it uh, out of order this time. I'm going to talk about the Discord server first. Uh, If you guys want to hang out with us, you want to talk to us, you want to send us your favorite memes, you can absolutely do all of that on the Discord. Uh, If you want to send a message, give a band suggestion, talk to other listeners of the show, try to figure out what my problem is, quote quote unquote. Uh, If you go to uh, discord.discussmetal.com, you can do all of that. We have a fun community there that we would love for you to join and be a part of. It's not weird. It's not culty. We're never going to ask you to drink a flavored drink. Just join the community. It'll be a lot of fun. Also, if you love this podcast and you listen every single week, drop us a review. Drop us a review anywhere where you can, and uh, we'll read it on the show. How about that? Speaking of comments and things that we're going to read on the show, I've got some comments for you tonight, Joe. Uh, We did Discuss Metal Live two months ago on a subject that's very near to Joe in my heart, which is uh, is elitism and gatekeeping in heavy music. And... uh, you know, we kind of knew going into that episode that we were going to attract exactly the types of people that, you know, that we were talking about. They're, you know, they're the ones that are going to be Googling it and looking for some kind of battle to fight. And uh, they did show up uh, and, uh, and and I'm here for it. So uh, Bog of Eternal Stench says, <laughs> and I'm going to try to I'm going to try to do the voices exactly the way I think that they probably sound. So bear with me. Wait a second. I need to hear this comment because if this is a negative and your screen name is Bog of Eternal Stench, you're about as big of a nerd as the guys on the Nerf Herder Council, just saying. And I'm right I mean, there with you. You're a Bowie fan, right? Absolutely. Right? Or a okay. Hoggle fan. Hey. Shut the fuck up, Tony. You're out of your element. Hey, there you go. Well, Bog of Eternal Stench dropped this truth bomb on us. In 2022, Comic-Con guys feeling huffy about gatekeeping are the prevailing pack mentality metalheads now. Case in point. All right. That's cool. There's only one word to describe that comment. Ambrosius! That is all. There you go. Well, you know, the thing about Comic-Con guys, um, yeah, man, like we're nerds. If, if you're a metal fan and you don't think that you're a nerd, um... You may want to you may want to practice a little bit of self awareness, man. We're nerds. If we <laughs> if you have if you have encyclopedic knowledge about anything, you you're a nerd. Just like straight up, most people don't have time for that. Trust me, I get it because I'm kind of one of them. Uh, but you know, just just you, you may you may want to look in the mirror a little bit on that one. Skulls of the Abyss comes in hot and says the irony is that these types of pop figure queens is why gatekeeping is necessary. I'm not sure what pop figure queens means, but I like it, and I will continue to use it as a screen name in the future uh, because I, I'm assuming it's a it's a very positive thing. Uh, I do actually have pop figurines behind me uh, that might have been visible in the shot during the video. I'm not sure, but uh, you know I do want to keep that pop figure collection going. So, do you have you an know, Elsa back there? Not yet, but if you know somebody that can get me one for a good price, that'd be amazing. I could get a whole bunch more queens if I can get a Freddy. <laughs> If I can get the Freddie Mercury pop figurine, I think that that's going to be icing on the cake. Uh, Ryan Rowe comes in and at Skulls of the Abyss and says, uh, LMAO, you mad, bro? Skulls of the Abyss comes back again and says, so y- you really just need affirmation in your personal tastes? I don't understand. You guys are hating on people hating? This seems circular. How do we know who is right? I'm going to say it's the first person to stop hating. Yeah, but I mean, we don't know that. Okay, we don't know. 
<laughs> and 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 as as our friend Skullsy the Abyss has said earlier, uh, you know that we are the reason why gatekeeping is necessary. So I was kind of hoping he'd dig into that a little bit more, but he didn't. But you know what are you gonna do? Um, so then uh, then we get another comment from uh, or no, okay, we got a comment from Discuss Metal Dan. That's that's me. Uh, I don't usually respond to these because I'm just like, yep, this person's being a shithead. Next. Uh, but, uh, I did say, you know, because I did think it was a legitimate question at first. Uh, and I said, I would, I would say people enjoying what they enjoy is the goal. Disagreements are fine and can be informative. The point of this chat for me personally was exploring why I also found myself being shitty with people who I perceived to have be- to have lesser taste than I did. And also to explore why heavy music fans tend to gravitate, gravitate, gravi- gravitate towards that kind of behavior. And then Skullsy the Abyss decides to show his ass and is like, yeah, I read that from your commentary a bit. The broader tone of this four-way public chat, though, was more so coming across as disagreement is an attack on me personally. I mean, but I mean, oftentimes, oftentimes it is, you know, uh, it, disagreements are never presented as disagreements online. They're, they're, dis- they're presented as personal attacks a lot of the time. And wasn't that because the it, point of the conversation? It was. To yes. say that disagreements are often made as an attack that's really what we were trying to say we need it to was. stop arguing with each other and start disagreeing more you know make the conversation effective and sometimes yeah it's okay just to like what you like i mean i like thrash metal most of the time in fact i like it all the time come at me <laughs> he goes instead of just giving an opinion on why any of you enjoy what you do you all psychologize and went ad hominem this is important later uh, on those who tested your public opinions on other forums and self victimized so uh, ad hominem in case you don't know is an argument that you make where you attack a person instead of attacking what they're saying or attacking their position in the exact same breath he follows it up with the fat one was coping and seething hardest of all I think maybe he will plop in here later it was at this point that I realized that our boy Skulls of the Abyss was only here to troll us and and, and try to get us to say more things. Um, and, you know, it, it's fine. I, I, I felt like I could just leave that one alone. But, I mean, the dude's attacking us for making ad hominem arguments and then just straight up hits us with an ad hominem literally one breath later. That's too good not to be intentional. So uh, we are going to give you a round of applause for that one. Joe, if you have like a shitty, low quality round of applause you could play there, that would be amazing. Guys, thank you for commenting. We love talking about comments, reading them, and discussing them on the show. So keep them coming. Uh, We are here for it. So, Dan, tell me and the listeners all about the Red Chord. Dude, so the Red Chord is an American metal band from Revere, Massachusetts. You know, like Paul Revere's ride. You get it? Got it. You get it. Okay, cool. Uh, These guys have been around since 1999, and uh, their guitarist slash vocalist uh, goes by the name of Mike Gunface McKenzie. Uh, Right then and there, you know you're about to hear something cool. (laughs) Right? Like, I mean, Gunface, and honestly, I hear it. You hear it? I hear hear the Gunface. I actually don't know if if it's just because of his vocals, but I would assume that if they weren't talking about his vocals, it would be an absolute missed opportunity. His vocals are definitely ear penetrating. So that's kind of a bullet thing, right? It's a bullet to your brain, man. And, uh, you know, these Does guys are have kind of butterfly all... wings. I don't know. I don't listen to shitty Smashing Pumpkin songs. Fuck you, dude. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry dude. I just I just became Skulls of the Abyss. My bad. Uh, okay. So... These guys are interesting to me because, yeah, it's easy to just call them another hardcore band or another metalcore band or something. But, like, if you really listen to these records, this band is so much more than that. They even they even get tagged all the time in the genres of technical death metal, grindcore, metalcore, and deathcore. And I don't really hear the deathcore side of it, at least not, not deathcore as we know it today, uh, where it's, like, all breakdowns. Like, I can't think of too many times where this band just, like, stopped. And then a, a fake bass drop came in, and then they started playing just a very slow, rhythmic, open note breakdown. Uh, they don't really do that. These guys definitely lean more towards the grind side of things, which I think is sorely lacking in a lot of metal these days. You know, these kids these days. <laughs> 
old man screams at cloud on podcast. Uh, but yeah, it definitely got to me uh, in a really, really good way. Whenever, whenever I first heard these guys, the first album I heard by these guys was Client, and uh, it absolutely blew me away. Uh, specifically for the uh, the lyric, "The penis was from heaven and descended into hell," uh, which I thought, wow, like, oh my dude. god, I was like, oh my god, this is going to be one of those funny bands. But I uh, actually turns out it's not funny. We'll we'll sort of talk about a little bit what the lyrics are about on Client. Uh, it's actually kind of, uh, again, it's kind of cool. Like everything these guys do is kind of cool and fun and demented in a way that isn't like super obvious and it's not very assuming. So like you do have to sort of pay attention. You can absolutely show up and just mosh, but you're missing out if that's all you do. They have a spastic quality to them that was very common at this point in the metalcore journey. Play fast. Stop. Play fast. Stop. They do that a lot. Then they throw in some dissonance. They throw in some general heavy melodic choices, basically keeping the term metalcore directly in front of your face. The definitions are here, and I enjoy what they're doing. It sounds raw in the beginning. I think the first album I heard was Clients also. But the record I enjoyed the most this week was the first one, Fused Together in Revolving Doors from 2002. Holy shit, what a debut. And I mean that sincerely. This is not me just trying to fluff up an episode where a band only has four records. But like this thing does not mess around. It does not it does not play with your emotions. It doesn't it doesn't lull you into a false sense of security. From the first second of Nihilist, the band is absolutely in your face, hitting you with just slabs and slabs and slabs of beef. Nihilist sets up some promises that I was worried they weren't going to keep. This is 2002. I shouldn't be hearing new metal in my hardcore and my metalcore, but I am certainly hearing some of those classic sounding corn decisions that we used to call new metal back in the day. If I have one complaint about the record is it does the old school hardcore thing. It goes fast and then it stops. I want the band to find a groove and stick with it for a minute. I know that wasn't the point, but it's what I'm looking for. The band is just so spastic. Not hardcore punk spastic, but they are trying to slam dance their tempo and their intensity into your brain. And it succeeds on this one. I like how raw the record sounds. It sounds like a record that you made in your basement with your friends, and that is fine. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about as far as the corn decisions and all that stuff, but... The dissonant, melodic, guitar things. You know, the... I don't know if that's exclusive to corn or not, but we can we can have that argument off, off air. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I think it's the word It's not what they that... play, it's how they play it, Dan. I think the word that, that comes to my mind when I'm listening to this is just grind. You hear a lot of that grind influence and that gets sort of fused in with the hardcore. And I know sometimes that can be a little confusing because it's like, is it grind? Is it hardcore? Obviously, the two styles have a lot in common with one another. So it, it's hard to nef- necessarily differentiate like, oh, yeah, this is the grindcore influence. It's a good blend, man. Like they just took all that shit. They took metalcore, technical death metal, and death grind and threw it in a magic bullet and just smoothed it out. And by smoothed it out, I mean they added it in like a whole bunch of like spiky metal rocks. I don't I really know how else to describe it. Um, this record doesn't make you feel good. It just beats you over the head. There's a little bit of melody they introduce sort of, sort of towards the middle of it, but like I mean, there's moments where I'm hearing, you know, more technical lead work than I'm used to, but then there it's got this like grind bass sort of going going beneath it, and the speed is just out of this world. So like even the more technical parts are not like necessarily cleaned up. They're just they're just start they're just a part of the blunt instrument. Uh, if I had to describe it as a physical object, I'd say it would be like a baseball bat with razor blades in it, you know. And and it really it, it cuts you and bludgeons you at the same time. And it does make you feel, although by the end of it, you probably won't be able to feel anything. And, um, and I think that's, that's kind of where it's at, man. They like, they really, really vary this record up. I mean, it's only, it's only like 29 minutes of just straight pummeling, beating you over the head, slicing you up, 
So but they don't, 10 minutes longer than the normal hardcore set back in the day. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're the red cord and you're going out on tour, you know, after putting this record out, you've got the perfect 30 minute slot. And, but you're also playing music that is far more complex. The bands that you listen to, let's put it this way. If you're, a, if you're a member of the Red Chord in 2001 or 2002, you are, you, your influences are not like your friend's influences. Like those guys are listening to At The Gates. Those guys are listening to In Flames. They're listening to Dark Tranquility uh, or they're listening to like Converge or Dead Guy. If you're in the Red Chord, man, you're listening to like Napalm Death and Suffocation. You know, you're, you, your riff quality is of a higher caliber than pretty much any other band in your scene, except for maybe like Between the Buried and Me. And that's what it actually reminds me of a little bit is like uh, Silent Circus era Between the Buried and Me without all the melodic progressive stuff. And that's actually kind of a nice sweet spot for me because I like it heavy. I mean, I like Between the Buried and Me as well, but like I'm not making a direct comparison, but like if you just took like the first part of Mordecai before it goes into like all of the, the the slower melodic singing stuff uh you just take that out you cut all the you cut all the progressive elements out of between the buried and me and you get something like the red chord and uh i'm here for it because that was one of my favorite things about bands like between the buried and me and the contortionist was that you know when they were heavy the heavy stuff was really really good too but as those bands went on uh that stuff sort of started getting downplayed in favor of the more progressive elements and so it's nice to hear a band sort of sticking to that complex but still brutal sound. Oh, you want to know what the album's called? Why the album's called that? Tell us, Dan. Well, uh, the album name is a reference to a nightclub fire that took place in Boston in the 1940s. Uh, the crowd tried to exit through a set of revolving doors. They were burned to death in the revolving doors. Uh, so that's they, they refused. Their bodies were fused together. In, in revolving doors. That's and if that's brutal. not a if that's not a grind as fuck name for an album, I don't know what is. Let's move on to 2005. Clients. Take a deep breath. Let the waves of classic metalcore and grind roll over you. Now read the lyrics. Now read what the lyrics are about. Congratulations, you have found your innermost Disgust Metal Dan. Yeah, man, this was crazy. I haven't read anything this sort of unhinged since uh, maybe the lyrics to Pig Destroyer's Prowler in the Yard. Uh, don't Ooh. do it. Do not do not do the voice. I don't know um, what you're talking about. You better not. Um, and at first I was like really weirded out by this record because I was like, what is the deal with these lyrics? You know, the, the famous penis line that I, that I talked about earlier. But lyrically, this is this is essentially an album that's about different mental health disorders. So that that would that sort of explains why everything seems like really, really unhinged, because it's from the perspective of somebody that has all of these different disorders, um, you, ranging from schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, uh, OCD, you know, all, all of that is present in this little 36-minute <laughs> record. And um, dare I say it, but this record is, is, is more intense and heavier than the last one. Almost intentionally, they turned everything up, but they bonded the sound of the guitars, the drums, the bass, the vocals. Everything gets a little bit muddier. Like they took that fused together idea and said, let's literally fuse together the sounds and create one very uncomfortable feeling. Everything about this record is better than the first one. The lyrics, the ideas, the intent, the emotion behind the lyrics and the music. Don't get me wrong, I like the first album. It's my favorite record by this band because it sounds so raw. It sounds like 2002, but it doesn't sound like the popular music in 2002. It sounds like the popular music from 1999, at least for me. This one is where the red chord starts. You and I need to have a conversation about what popular music sounded like in 1999. <laughs> I was there too. It's fine. 
What was popular in 1999? Anyway, we'll figure that out later. You guys, I'm pretty sure to. it was Limp Biscuit. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, it doesn't it doesn't sound like that? Uh, clients is a much more $3 blunt bill, record. Y'all. Clients is a much more blunt record. It's in your face. Even the vocals sound more blunt. I don't really know how to describe blunt to you guys. Like, just I don't know. Like, pull up, pull up, uh, fixation on plastics, and you can sort of hear it. The vocals do have like a little bit more of a like. Almost like there's like a like a thin piece of fabric in the back of the guy's throat. I don't. I can't really know how to describe it. I just I've been listening to extreme vocals like this most of my life at this point. These vocals are not as clear as they were on the last record, but like it's better somehow that way. Like it's it's more um, blunt. That's the only word I could use. Obviously, somebody just wants blunt. Uh, but no, like this was. This was more percussive, more angry, more pissed off, but also just demented in its in its structuring. And I think that's what blew me away more than anything was that was just how demented they are with the tempos, changing them up, going almost switching genres in places, much like they did on the last album, but like with a little bit more like attention to care and a little bit more detail. Like it's like calculated spasticness with with crazy sort of complicated squeals and pinches and 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 just there's a lot i'm not a music major guys it's hard for me to describe some of this stuff but trust me whenever i say translated uh, the guitars are heavy no that's not what i'm saying at all <laughs> uh, no you, you you fucked it up no it's that's not right uh it's uh it's that the it's that there is complexity to this. It's so easy to sit down and make a hardcore record. These guys sat down and basically composed all of this stuff. Either that or they're just geniuses. But like absolutely nothing sounds out of place. It all works while still being spastic and unpredictable. And that is far more that is far more noticeable here than I think it was even on the last record. This is one that you have to sort of slow down, pay attention to, keep track of what they're doing. Listen to the drummer, man. Listen to how much, listen to how many changes are taking place in these little like two minute, three minute songs where these guys could absolutely have gone the prog route at any moment and it would not surprise me at all. But they seem really stuck on this like, we're just going to be technical enough to raise your eyebrows, but heavy enough and insane enough to keep you moshing. We're never going to go full Opeth, but we are going to stay very much Tony Danza. See, I don't even know if it's as crazy as Tony Danza. There's almost too much structure to it for that. Two sort of different approaches to that, whereas something like Tony Danza is going to come from a more of a more of a chaotic metalcore or or um, there's a little bit of deathcore in, in Tony Danza as well. But uh, like they, they, it's like those guys listen to a lot of Dead Guy, and they listen to a lot of Converge. Like I said before, these guys listen to like stuff like Suffocation. I don't know that personally. Don't at me. But it sounds <laughs> like it sounds like they do. And that's what that's what I get with this whole like sort of technical death metal deathcore sound. And like this is you know speaking of elitists, this is the kind of music elitists hate because I know they love the guitars, but they hate the vocals. Two thousand and seven, pray. For eyes. So much beef. I hate how the drums sound fake on this one. I know he's playing the parts, but somebody grabbed the bass drum like Lars Ulrich grabbed the bass guitar and said, turn it down 60 B. It's not as clean. It sounds fake. And for a band that was doing so good on clients, this one's a bit of a letdown. I know the guy can still do it, but the creative decision, the production decision, turn down the drums. Wrong answer for a band that's this fucking good. Interesting. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if the drums are fake or not. I don't care really. But um, the bass drum. Ah, God damn it! Why did you say that? Because now, because I'm listening to it in my headphones too, and the bass drums. The bass drum does sound quieter than the than the other drums. Anyway, uh, whatever. Uh, this one, man. It's interesting hearing them drop in sort of a little bit more of a groove here than what we had had before. Just a little bit, not not a whole lot. This is still in your face, technical grind, metalcore, whatever you want to call it. Magic bullet metal. That's the word I'm going to start using for it. You Copyright. Gotta, you got to load the 
Yeah, you gotta you gotta load the uh, the gun face with the magic bullet, right? And um, I love it, man. This guy this guy almost sounds a little bit more like old school death metal. I hear more death metal and a little bit more groove with this one, and uh, I love it. It's certainly not my favorite, but they are sort of on this trajectory where I think that they are going to go like more progressive at some point. They're just like just on the cusp uh, cusp of it. But they never go there. They, they never hit us with a nine minute song, you know, I mean, every now and again, sure. Like they'll throw you a seven minute song that like ends the album off. But like that's kind of be kind of to be expected at this point. This one has sort of more complex, uh, more complex lead work, a little bit more of like a bouncy feel. It's not as straight ahead mosh as clients was. And um, so they're definitely showing their more metal side here and i mean i'm here for it man i don't have anything bad to say about this record at all it's 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 fantastic it's red cord i don't know how they've done it three times in a row because like a lot of bands we talk about the first two albums are like the defining moment then you get to like the third and fourth and that's when they start changing things and things are changed here a little bit like there's you know there's keyboards there's a moog synthesizer <laughs> you know uh, at one point like so they they are doing things, but they still have their initial sound intact. That that sort of unpredictable, techy grind metalcore stuff. The guitars have a rasp to them that reminds me of the first release. Maybe the previous album had a budget, and this one was a step down to independent, and we want to make a record and not spend so much time on the production side of it. But I honestly don't think that's the case. I think this just had a different set of creative hands. I'm bothered by some of the production choices. Like I said, the bass drum being so low in the mix, I, I think that's a mistake. But the guitars having that gnarly, raspy sound that sounds like 2002, I think it works for this band. It gives them attention that everybody wants with their heavy grind genres but this band, they never go full melodic. If anything, it sounds like the band is limiting themselves to the four low strings on the guitar and trying to invent as many dissonant, grindy riffs as they possibly can without ever touching the top octave of the fretboard. I know that's not 100% the case, but that's what it feels like when I'm listening to it. I feel you. Um... Yeah, I mean, I don't think that they have done anything truly revolutionary here, but I also think that, like, that was the whole point. The whole point was was to always keep sort of the, the moshy heaviness to its, like, apex, you know? Like, they still want to be a band in a certain sense, I think, that just wants to play clubs and play with other hardcore bands, but they're, like, too good at musicians to... To just to just sort of crap one out and be like, here you guys go. Here's some breakdowns. Let's go. Let's see. Uh, let's see you guys fight some invisible ninjas in the pit. Let's do it. Like, it's 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 a it's a weird sort of like, we don't want to get like too big for our britches, but we also like want to be musically challenged. I think there's a lot more like time and thought and effort put into these songs than what you would normally get from a grind band or even a technical death metal band. In a lot of ways, there's almost a little too much feeling that shines through for it to just be like harsh, cold, technical metal. And um, I think that's that's really what it works is they, they keep that they keep the, the mechanical and human elements really in balance. Shall we move on to 2009 fed through the teeth machine, which gives me some Mangler vibes right off the bat. I take that back. Mangler 2. You know, the really insane one. <laughs> well, uh, I can tell you the origin if you want to know it. Um, it's just basically that they were watching uh, the Discovery Channel. They were watching how it's made. Uh, and they were, I guess they were seeing how zippers were made. And it says that they feed zippers through the teeth machine. And so they're like, dude, that sounds uh, terrifying. We, we need to name our record that because... We're still trying to chew, we're still trying to top fuse together in revolving doors. So uh, fed through the teeth machine is sort of uh, par for the course if you're going for, you know, peak creepiness. Do you think this album is the perfect balance 
of the red chord onslaught. The guitars are a little bit louder, like they should be. The drums are heavy. They're up front in the mix. You can hear what everyone is playing, and the vocals are in mass quantities, almost unintelligible at times, but so brutal you can understand what the guy's saying. I mean, in my personal opinion, this is the best Red Chord album. It is everything that the potential of this band has been building up towards. Uh, it is brutal in your face. It's heavy, but there's all this melodic, fun, dripping, techy guitar work going on that I love. Like this is why this is why I love Cattle Decapitation so much. Uh, later on in their career, was because they were doing stuff like this. They were they were not slowing down, but they're just they're incorporating a lot more melody into this grind, and it sounds so good. It sounds so. It sounds so um, profound in a way. Uh, you know, it's kind of like what Jeff said a long time ago when we did that Pantera episode uh, where he's like, you know, when I listen to certain songs, they just make me feel invincible. That's how I feel uh, when I'm listening to the red chord, especially on this record, is you feel strong, you feel powerful, you feel right, you feel like there's a lot of meaning. A little tiny bit of melody mixed with a heavy song like that is the secret sauce in what takes something from just being a brutal machine that people aren't going to necessarily understand. These are the kind of songs you could show to somebody that's not into metal, and don't get me wrong, they're still not going to like it, but they might have a better understanding about why you like it, because it's got more complexity to it than just noise and just cold, hard technicality. There's a lot more human feeling in a lot of the melodies that are sort of sprinkled into this. And uh, like I said, I think it's the perfect. It is it, it is the perfection of what the band has sort of been building to before. They've had moments like this on previous records, but here every song is that way. And that's, it's not formulaic. And when I say melodic, I don't mean that they're going to start hitting us with a bunch of clean singing or anything like that. I don't want that in my heavy te techie record, right? I just want straight onslaught, just straight gun face, right? And one hundred percent. You get that. You get you get faster moshy bits. There's almost like a like like almost a hint of melodic hardcore in here that I wasn't expecting. And it just sounds so good, man. Like th this record. And normally I would say like if you're gonna start listening to the band tomorrow, that you should start with this record. But I don't think that you should because I think you might be disappointed with the other ones. Or whereas I think that the first three records should really be enjoyed sort of for what they are before you go into here and you're like, oh, well, how come every record doesn't sound like that? Well, they had to build up to this. If the previous album was the heavy parts of a Between the Buried and Me album, this one is 50% the melody from the Between the Buried and Me record. This is the best parts of Colors to me, where the melody is not implied as much as there's a big ambient melody on the top of it, I think this band, ever since Clients, has been playing with this dissonant feeling, trying to make the listener uncomfortable, and then onslaught of technicality. Yes, this band can play faster and just better than I will ever be able to, with any group of musicians. They are in sync in a way that is necessary when you're playing this style of music. But then they put this dissonant, just dirty sound on the top of it that makes you feel uncomfortable. It puts you on edge. And they're not doing anything different underneath it. It's just there to throw you off a little bit. I don't know if that's to make the music memorable or just to force the listener into an uncomfortable state but it works. It keeps the vibe where it needs to be when I'm listening to the red chord. And overall, I just want to keep listening to it. There's a lot here that's just not memorable. There's not a melody or a riff that I can point to and say, that's cool. But I want to keep listening to it, which doesn't make any sense to me because it's death metal, it's death core, it's grind. It's all these styles that are being spastic and thrown together and it's working. I think that's what's interesting about this band, that with four records, it's still interesting. Yeah, I mean, and then they were like, yeah, no more for you. And I was like, oh, 
You know, like it just kind of bums me out. Uh, the band, I mean, basically the band broke up in 2013 um, because one of their members um, became a sworn police officer of the Manchester, New Hampshire Police Department and uh, decided that, that that being a law enforcement officer was, pro- and let's be honest, probably paid more than being in the red court. Uh, and it sounded like something that he just wanted to do. Now, I know that the band... Uh, did announce that they would be performing uh, at the Decibel Metal and Beer Fest. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. Uh, they did something in 2015, but I don't know what it was. Uh, but, you know, they haven't put out any records. So uh, according to all the people that make fun of us, uh, that means they haven't actually done anything, right? Um, but, you know, with, with the... Uh, with these albums, these albums are basically like this. Is almost like can I can I award this? I think the Red Chord has basically a perfect discography uh, in just these four records, and I'm sure a fifth one would be perfect as well. Just based on on my experience listening through these, it's just been a while. It would be interesting to see what the Red Chord would sound like coming in hot in 2022. Maybe they'll do that. Maybe they won't do that. I hope they do that. So if you guys are listening, you know, there's at least one guy that hopes that you do that. Would that be your final thought on the red cord? Well, my final thought really would just be listen to this band, man. Like if you've been listening to everything we've been trying to tell you on this show since it started, these are the kind of bands that I tend to gravitate towards. Uh, Just having that, that really unattainable mix of heaviness and quality songwriting and complex songwriting. Um, I think that these guys are sort of a hidden gem. They get overshadowed by bands that are far more progressive than they are. But this this pleases Unpleasable Metal Fan and that they do the same thing enough to where I don't get angry about it. Um, but they, they, they don't have so many records that all sound the same that I'm like also angry about it. Um, you know, I have a very, very interesting, unique set of expectations when I listen to music. And uh, these guys meet every one of them. It's a it's a rare example of that. I can't say the discography is perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect for me to enjoy it. And I enjoyed all of it. I'm still enjoying listening to this band. I don't spend a lot of time with spastic bands that just play riffs and constantly change. Mostly, that's just not interesting to me. It's fun. And it can be interesting for a time, but I don't go back to it looking for a riff or an idea that really held on to my attention because I'm anticipating the band to change. The Red Chord has just the right mix of spastic with dissonance, heavy, technicality, and brutality. I don't think Metalcore can claim it. I don't think Deathcore can claim it. I think this is just a heavy band, a technical heavy band for fans of heavy music. And I don't think you have to be a technical fan to really appreciate what the Red Chord is doing. And for all the classic death metal fans or the classic thrash fans that just want something to be brutal and spastic and have no respect for the tempo, you're going to get something enjoyable from the Red Chord. Listen to this band. Dan, what's your album of the week? Dude, my album of the week. Holy crap. First of all, I got I to gotta laugh about this. Uh, Lance was very, very surprised uh, that I that I chose the uh, the newest uh, Blood, Canta- Blood Incantation album because it's so not metal, right? But uh, yeah, no, I know. I liked it specifically for that reason. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was coming off of listening to a lot of really, really, really heavy stuff. But, uh, you know, we, uh, we did an episode on Deicide lately, and, uh, you know, when, when the album Overtures of Blasphemy came out, I didn't pay it much attention, but I've actually been still kind of listening to that one since the Deicide episode. So that's my album of the week. Once I started, I could not stop. And thank you to Brian Patton from As the Story Grows for getting the interview. I've been listening to Personal Computer by Master Boot Record at least this week, but probably a lot longer. It has been a fun change of pace. It's not industrial. It's not electronic. It's electronic industrial music that's composed like heavy metal, and I love it. It's not Rammstein. It's not 
that video game soundtrack, it's all of those things. If you haven't given it a shot, you really need to. Plus, dude has like 14 albums on Bandcamp, at least. Maybe more than that. You should go buy him. Joe, Joe's like a uh, a Bandcamp shill. They don't pay him. He just he just tells you to give send him money. Take us out, DFT. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Discography Discussion. If you guys want more, just can't get over the sound of our voice, make sure to hit us up at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks, uh, including individual album reviews. We do a monthly live show that includes a hangout. You can watch the live show for free, but if you want to hang out with us afterwards, you got to join the Patreon. Uh, and we can, we can sort of keep that discussion going uh, face-to-face. So make sure you guys are, are checking that out. One of the newest perks is being able to skip the wait. If you want us to talk about a band right now or within the next month, uh, disclaimer, there's one specific way that you can do that. There's more details on that on Patreon. If you guys want to hang out with us other than that, make sure you're checking out the Discord server, discord.discussmetal.com. And if you're on social media, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion or on Instagram and Twitter at discuss metal. We hope to see you guys soon. If you guys have any other comments, questions, concerns, send us an email at Dan and Joe show at gmail.com. And on that note, this has been episode 281 of discography discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at discuss metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Podchaser. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please, send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. Uh, sir, your card was declined. I'm going to need you to give me that money. Because $1 a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. 